Progress. Today we're going to be learning Ta'anit Daf Kavtet. We're really nearing the end of the Masechet. This is the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to start right at the beginning. I should just review before we, we continue um, that the Siyum is on Sunday. So that means that Sunday morning you should learn the Daf before you come to the Siyum. The Daf will be up the regular Daf for that day. Because the real daf is ending on Monday. We're just doing the seum on Sunday because it's a better day for people. So Sunday, you should listen in the morning to the daf and then come to the seum. I hope you're all registered. If you're all joining, you can still register. It's not too late. You can register up until um, before the seum. It's fine. Okay, and the link gets automatically sent to you. So hopefully you all received it. So now we're getting to the Tishabav description in the Mishnah about what the five things that happened on Tishabav, and we're going to figure out how we know that those things happened. Minnalan, how do we know that on Tishabav they were told they can't come into the land? Dichtiv Vayhiv. Okay, we're going to get a whole list of events, chronology, what happened. I made on the study guide today, it's a very short study guide, but it has, I just charted out the events and the dates to make it a little bit easier to follow. In the first month, on the second year to get out of the out of Egypt, um, on the first day of the first month, that's the first of Nisan, who came a Mishkan? The Mishkan was put up. And it was stated that Shana Rishona Asa Moshe et Hamishkan. The first year after getting out of Egypt, Moshe built the Mishkan. Shnia Heki Moshe et Hamishkan, and in the second year he put it up. Vishalach Meraglim and he sent spies. So the spies happened in the second year, and now we'll go through the chronology. Uchtiv. The next date we get in the Torah is in that same second year, on the twentieth day of the month, of the second month, that's the twentieth of Iyar. Naaleh Anam Me'amishkana Idut, the Anan, the cloud goes up from above the Oamoed, and that everyone, that's the tent of meeting. Everybody knows that's a sign that we're going to start moving. And then it says, They left the mountain of God. That's where they received the Torah. They went to go for three days. They're ready to go into the land now. Right? This is when everything's about to be perfect and they're going to go right into the land. And then everything goes wrong. So, uh, sorry, uh, Oh, so let's just talk about the three days. So that's Kaf B'Iyar, Kaf Aleph B'Iyar, and Kaf Bet B'Iyar. So that takes us to the 22nd day of Iyar. Amar Rabbi Chama Brachanina, that day they turned away from God. And there's a famous midrash on that, like a tinoka borech mi beta sefer, like a child who runs away from school. That's the way they ran away from the from Har Hashem. Said, "Oh, enough of this! You know, we're happy to be out of here." And that's where everything starts going wrong. That's when the Asaf Suf that was with them, those were, according to the Midrash, the the Egyptians that had joined them that had decided to leave Egypt with them started saying, oh, we need meat, we don't have any meat here, we don't want the man anymore. And then they got the, Jew, the Jews also to get upset about this, and they cried. Right? And then they got punished, and they get all this slav and all that coming out of their ears, and for a, a month, for a whole month. So if we're talking a whole month, that starts on Kaf Gimel, the day after they traveled for three days. Then this event happens, that starts on the 23rd, takes them to the 22nd of Sivan, which is the next month. So, Dahavalu Esrim Vitartim B'Sivan. So, that's now 22nd of Sivan. Uchtiv, and then it says, Vatisagir Miriam Shivat Yamin. The next thing that happens in the next chapter is Miriam gets leprosy because she spoke about Moshe with Aaron. And then it says that she had leprosy and she had to be closed, right? She had to be out of the, the, the machane, the camp, for seven days and they waited for her. So that's another seven days. So we're on the 22nd of Sivan. Now we get to the 29th. And then it says, We assume that happened on the seventh day, that they're meant to send spies. Because that's two chapters later. Itanya, right, it's the next real event that happens. And then there's a brighter that says, Here's a, a brighter that supports this. That on the 29th of Siva, Moshe sends the spies, Uchtiv, and then it says, Vayashuvu mitorah aretz, miketz arba'in yom. They get back from the land, from, from spying on the land, after 40 days. So, Hane arba, okay, so now before we get to the question, we're now going to count. 
two days of Sivan, because Sivan is always Malay, 30-day month, which means the next month is going to be only 29 days. So two days of Sivan, 29 days of Tammuz, that's 31. And then we need eight days of Av. We want to basically end up on the 8th of Av so that that night when they cried and they got all upset and they were told they're not going to go into the land, that's the ninth. So how do we have 31 and another 8? That gets us up to 39. We need 40. So the Gemara is going to say, right? because if they were there 40 days, that would put us at the end of the ninth day. When you know, they cried, it would be the night of the 10th. So the Gemara says, wait a minute. That's 40 minus 1. That's 39. So uh, uh, Amar Abaye, Abaye answers. Tamuz dahishata miluye maluha. That year, Tammuz was Malay, meaning they had Sivan was 30 days and Tammuz was 30 days. How do you know this? Well, you don't really know it directly, but there's a, an allusion to it in the Pasuk in Echa. Dichtiv kara alai mo'ed l'shbor b'churai. In Echa, Lamentations, it says, I called a mo'ed, a specified time, which is a reference to Rosh Chodesh. God decreed Rosh Chodesh would be that month, l'shbor b'churai, to break my, my lads. Okay, so basically what we're saying here is that God orchestrated it, that it would happen, that there, that month would be a full month so that he could orchestrate things that it would fall out on the same night that he knew in the future the temple was going to be destroyed. And then it says, And then they all cried that night, which is the night after the 8th, which was the, after the 40 days, according to our new count. By the way, I just want to point out there's something strange about this. If you learn Rosh Hashanah with us, you'll know that we kept discussing how what makes Rosh Hashanah unique. The Rosh Hashanah is a day that that the we determine, as opposed to Shabbat that God determines, Rosh Hashanah, right? This is something not just that we discuss, but everybody, this is why we say Mekadesh Shabbat, and on holidays, Mekadesh Israel Vazmanim. God sanctifies Shabbat, but we sanctify the holidays. We're the ones to determine. You hear God saying, I determined it this time. Right? That sometimes God in, intervenes in things that he's not supposed to intervene in for, you know, let's say if we do things wrong or something like that, if we're deserving of it. So that's what happened here. Some people have the version that doesn't say Erev here. What it really means is it was the night of Tisha B'Av, not Erev like the day before. It was the night of, like Erev Shabbat is Friday night. Even though really in Hebrew you call it Lel Shabbat. Erev Shabbat is really Friday. Lel Shabbat is, so it was really Tisha B'Av that night. Amar Lema Kadosh Baruch Hu, this we quoted when I said the Mishnah, right? It's famous because Rashi quotes it in the, in the Torah there. Most people know this. Atem b'chitem b'chiyah shal chinam v'ani kovea lachem b'chiyah l'dorot. So this appears in the Gemara here. You cried for no reason. I'll give you a real reason to cry, right? And for generations. Now we're going to get to the next date. The next date is the first temple is destroyed. Dichtiv, as it says, Okay, first I want you to notice this is a verse in Malachim. And it says that in the fifth month, which is Av, on the seventh day of the month, which in the 19th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, Rav HaTabachim, he's the one who kind of slaughters everybody. So I think why he's called the Rav HaTabachim, maybe he's the head of the army. Eved Melech Bavel Yerushalayim. Okay, he's the servant of Melech Bavel. He comes to Yerushalayim. Vayisrof et Beit Hashem. And he burns the house of God. Notice what day it says. The seventh day, not the ninth day. You would expect to say the ninth day. We'll get to that soon. Uchtiv, ubechodesh chamishi be'asor lechodesh. Hishna tshas reishana lemelech nevuchanetza. Melech Bavel. Ban vuzarad an rabat tabachim. Amad lefnei melech Bavel b'Yerushalayim. Okay, here you have a very similar pasuk except that in the beginning it says, on the Esor Lachodesh, on the 10th of the month. There's another minor difference which says, instead of Eve Melech Bavel Yerushalayim, which is a little bit weird, this makes more sense. It says, Amad Lefnei Melech Bavel Yerushalayim. He stood before the king of Bavel in Yerushalayim. And then, again, he burns the house of God. This is a pasuk from Jeremiah, from Yermiyam. Vetanya. And then the Brita on these contradictory verses says, can't be it was burnt on the 7th because it says it was burnt on the 10th. But you also can't say it was the 10th because it already says it was the 7th. So how does that work? Now here we have again a problem with where you put the period. Let's just read it. Okay, so on the 7th, 
they came into the sanctuary and they started eating and desecrating. They started the, the messy kind of work. They started, ah, this place is nothing and destroying things. But, Samuch Lecha Shecha Itzitu Bota Or. It could be, right, they did that on the 7th, on the 8th, Shvi Ishmini Uchi'i, and the 9th. Or it could be they did it on the 7th and the 8th, and in the 9th, Samuch Lecha Shecha, as it got close to being dark, meaning the end of the ninth day. So therefore, you could read it either which way, it means at the end of the ninth day, and probably Kilkilu, 7th, 8th, and 9th. Okay, so it's not like it's a big difference how, to, how, to, how it reads. It's just more a matter of, in the, 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 Content is basically the same. No matter what, it's the end of the ninth day. The the burning began. It's just a matter of where you put the period there. If it's before the words end on the ninth, or it's after the words end on the ninth. But in any case, what happens? Or so close to dark on day number nine, meaning the end, end, end of day number nine. They start lighting the fire. And then it went and burnt the whole day of the tenth. So the seventh, they started it, the tenth, they ended it. And that's why those are the two uh, dates that are quoted. You might say then, well, then wouldn't it be, have been better that we put a fast on one of those days? So anyway, let's read. First, they say, Shanamal, how do we know it happened late at night? Uh, sorry, toward the end of the ninth day. Okay, here's a verse. Um, this is from, sorry, I lost the place. I just want to see where that comes from. I forgot right now. Okay, it's in Yirmiyahu. Okay, it says, We're gonna, they, they made a, a war. Woe to us because the day is turning, meaning it's getting to be evening already. And we already see the shadows of the nighttime, okay, of the evening. So no, evening, not night. There are no shadows at night. Um, so not, certainly not from, right, maybe a little from the moon. Anyway, the main idea is that this happened at nighttime. So now they say, If I were living then, and the temple was destroyed, I would have made it on the 10th. That's when most of the burning happened. And they say, Otoyom, um, Sorry, I lost my place. Okay. The Rabbanan, so what do the rabbis say? Why did they make it on the ninth? It doesn't really make so much sense. It chalta de puranita adifa. Rather with the beginning of the bad. In other words, when the things started getting bad, that was when they wanted to celebrate that, or to, to not celebrate the opposite, to mark that as a sad day because that's the worst. When it started, that was the worst. Okay. This actually, this next source really kind of... Um, Simplifies that idea. We'll talk about it in a minute. Bashniya minalan. How do we know that the second temple was also destroyed on Tisha B'av? So they say, Titan, as it says on a bright megalgalim schut liyom zakai v'chovah liyom chayav. There's this concept that certain days are good, happy days, and then happy things happen on that day as well. There's sad days in the calendar. Other things, sad things happen at the same time as well. Okay, on those same days. And that's why it must be, they're just assuming it must be that that's the case. And Amru, and people say, When the first temple was destroyed, It was, okay, again, many people say it's not Erev Tisha B'Av, it's Tisha B'Av Haya. It's Tisha B'Av. That year, Tisha B'Av came out on a Sunday. It was after the Shemitah year, it was the first year of the new Shemitah cycle. We'll get back to why they're mentioning all these things. It was the Mishmerit of Yehoyariv. They were the ones, we were been talking about the Mishmarot, they were the ones on duty that, that um, month. The Halavim, uh, sorry, that week, the Levim were singing at the time. And standing in their places. What was the song they were singing? What psalm were they singing? They were saying the verse, that God will return your iniquities and he will cut them off because of their evil deeds. Exactly at that moment, very appropriate. Which is the continuation of that verse, that God will cut them off. Right, it's a double language of will cut us off. And then it says again, God will cut us off. Um, until the Gentiles came and they captured them. The same thing happened the second time. 
Okay, so what does it mean? First of all, what does it mean the same thing happened the second time? They don't mean that it was the Mishmar of Yo Yariv and all these things happened. No, no, no. It was that this, it was destroyed on the same day, the beginning of this line about that it happened on Tisha B'Av. That happened again, the same thing, the second time around. But why are we getting this huge description of how exactly it happened and what, who was in the temple at the time and what were they saying and all that? First of all, obviously, they were, it was ominous, right? They were talking about this verse about God punishing us, and then they came with the punishment. But I think it's more so. It's like when someone asked you, where were you when you heard about 9-11, right? When you heard the, the towers were burning down. Where were you? You know exactly where you were, right? Where were you? It was always the famous when I was growing up, right? Where were you when Kennedy was assassinated? Everybody knew. I was too young, but right, I wasn't alive then. But, but that, these are events that are shocking events. And you remember all the details about them. You remember exactly where you were, right? For me also being um, another event that we all remember is where were you when you heard about Robin's assassination, right? These are things that are so shocking that you remember exactly where you were, what you were doing, what time of day it was. All those details are crystal, crystal clear. So I think that that's what this, this source is expressing, that feeling of that's what this event was for them, obviously, right? Totally shocking, scary event. Nilkida Beta. Okay, moving on. But this was anyway, they brought that really for a different reason, which was to show that the second one happened on the day of the first, and that we basically have a tradition about. That's how we know. We don't really have proof for it otherwise. Nilkida Beta. First of all, they weren't living so far away from the destruction also, so they didn't need so much proof for it. At the first temple, you really need proof because nobody was, anyone writing the temp, you know, writing the, these sources were way far away from that event. But the destruction happened in 70. It wasn't so far off. Nilkida Betal, Gemara. Okay, the fact that Betar was captured, that was in the, Mer- the, the Bar Kokhba rebellion, that is a Gemara. That means it's a tradition. We just know that that's what happened, and it happened on the 9th of Av. Nechrishahir, the city was plowed. Basically means entirely destroyed. This was after the destruction of the temple. This is years later. They destroyed the city, the Romans. Tanya, right that describes this. Kishacharav Tornus Rofus. Arasha et haichal. Okay, Tornus Rofus. Some people explain it comes from the word tyranny, tyrant. Okay, that it's really a name of a, a tyrant, not necessarily his own personal name. When he destroyed the heichal, nigzirag zera Rabban Gamliel lahariga. They decreed that we're, they're going to kill Rabban Gamliel. Ba Adon Echad, or some people have hegemon Echad. Okay, a, a Roman officer got up. Va'amad bebeit hamidrash. He came into the Beit Midrash. Va'amal. The person of stature, okay, it really means the one with the nose. Um, maybe this source about Jews having long noses, I don't know. But Rashi says, what does it mean, Balachotem? It means Bal Koma Vitsura, someone of a person of import. Okay, uh, a different language Rashi says is Gadol Adol. Maybe it's, a, it's a, for a Gadol, right? A, a great Torah scholar. In any case, comes in and basically says, Rabban Gamliel, run for your life. You know, they're going to kill you. So he goes and he quickly hides from this guy, right? He thinks, he doesn't know why this guy is coming. Maybe he thinks the guy's coming to kill him. He runs away. The guy finds him and goes to him quietly. He says to him, listen, If I save you, will you promise me a life in the world to come that I'll get rewarded in the world to come? He says, yes, I will. He says, swear to me. Ishtabale, he swore to him. Slik la agra nafilumet. He goes up to the roof, he falls and dies, right? Probably committed suicide. Okay, and that was his way of kind of, uh, you'll see why he did that and what, what that brought about. Ugemire, it's known, if people are involved, the people who made a decree and then one of them dies, they take that as a bad omen, right? They believed in all these gods, right? They were pagan believers that probably one of the gods was angry at us for doing it. So they repeal the decree. So what did they do? Right? They repeal the decree. Yatsda bat kova amra. A heavenly voice came down and said, Adon zem zuman l'chaya olam abba. This person, right, he's going straight up to olam abba. He's going to get a share in the world to come for saving Rabban Gamliel. Tanu Rabbanan, another bright that describes this time period. Now we're sorry, not this time period. Now we're going back to stories of Bayat Rishon, of the first temple. When the first temple was destroyed, 
some of the youth of the Kohanim went up to the roof of the Hechal. Remember, the Hechal had a cover on it. And they had the keys to the Hechal in their hands. Alu l'gag Hechal v'amru l'fanav. Sorry, I didn't read that part yet. I said they went up to the roof. We hadn't read it yet. So first they got together, and then they went up to the roof of the Hechal of the sanctuary, v'amru l'fanav. And they said, they went up to, almost like they rose up to kind of be closer to God, speak to God, and they said, also, what happened, the the Beit HaMikdash was, was being burned, so they ran upstairs before the fire got to them. And they said, Listen, we weren't, in the end, trusty. Um, Gizbarim is like a treasurer. We didn't keep your stuff in, a, in the proper manner. We obviously messed up. It's our fault that this is being destroyed. We better give you back your keys. Okay, this is interesting. This is similar to about returning Rov Tova, and they have the keys. They're returning them and they're saying, listen, we, they don't belong to us. We, 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 um, we messed up and therefore take them back. Sorry, I read that. Please take the keys back. They throw them up into the sky. A type of hand comes down, something like a hand. Remember, we had this in the Rabbi Hanina Bardosa Bendosa story. When the hand comes down and brings them uh, the golden leg of the table, and then they want to return it, right? And the hand comes down and takes it. So here also, the hand comes down, Ukibaltan Mehem, and he ta- they ta- the hand takes it away. And then they basically do a suicide mission. Maybe that's why the story is here, because we just talked about a suicide mission. And they basically jump into the fire. Valehen konen Yishayahu and Avid, the Pasuk in Yishayahu, or the Psukim in Yishayahu, we'll see, in chapter 22. For, we're first going to read from the first two Psukim, and then we're going to skip to Pasuk Hey, the fifth Pasuk, says, Masa Gechi Zayon, okay, the valley of, that's viewed, Rashi says that's Yerushalayim, because everybody always looks toward Yerushalayim. Ma lecha efok yalita kulech laganagot, why did you all go up to the roofs? This is a reference to this story. This place was bustling. There were tons of people and happiness and all sorts of good things happening. But now it's just full of dead people. They're not people that were killed by the, by the sword. They're not people that were killed in war. And what are they? They must be people who committed suicide. And then on that it says, God says in chapter in verse five in that chapter, Mikalkel Kil Vishoa El Har. The shout the sh- you can hear the shouting over the walls, and it's God is shouting so loud that you can hear it, it goes over the walls, the sound carries, and it goes up to the mountain. Those are two places where sound doesn't usually carry, but God's cry is so loud that it carries all the way over to there. Okay. So that's a description of something that happened in the first temple time period. Right, whether these stories are true or not, that's a whole separate thing. But these are traditions and stories that we have as part of our tradition. So I mentioned this when we learned the Mishnah, now we're going to see it quoted. And then we're going to see other things that he specifically said in the name of Rav. Just like when Av comes in, we limit how many happy things we do. When Adar comes in, we're very happy. Amar Rav Papa, here's a very um, practical thing that comes out of this. Rav Papa says, Hilkach bar Yisrael di'i le'dina bahade nochri. Therefore, if you have a Jew, um, sorry, one second, I realize my mic wasn't plugged in. Um, if you have uh, a judgment with a, with a Gentile, lishtamit mine ba'av de'rei amazale. Don't do it in Av because the you have bad luck in Av. It's a bad month. Bad month for the Jewish people. This is like the whole idea that bad things happen in a time when bad things happen. Make yourself available, specifically in Adal, because there you have good luck. Now we're going to bring other drashot that Rav Yehuda said, the son of Rav Shmuel Bar Shilat said in the name of Rav. So this is a verse in Yirmiyahu which discusses this is talking about the exile in Babylonia, so that you have a future and hope. Okay, you're going to have the following things. What things do they have there that gave them a future and hope? These are the palm trees, which are the dates 
right? We talked about a lot of times, we keep going back to that about the dates, how Ula talked about how they have so many dates there, and dates were a form of sustenance we just discussed the other day, and clay pishan, linen clothing, because linen clothing is considered very good quality. Both these things last long, they provide support for many, for a long time, both food and clothing. Another Pasuk Yidarshans, This is what Yaakov says to um, sorry, Yitzchak says to Yaakov, when Yaakov dresses up as Esav, he says, you, sound, you smell like the fields that God blessed. What is he talking about? He smelled like a field of apples. What the significance of this, I don't know. We're willing to, um, open to hearing suggestions. What the connection of this is. First of all, what all these things have to do with each other, right? Again, in the Gemara's world, it's enough to just say, these are drashot that, Rav Yehuda Bar, uh, the son of Shmuel Rashilat, said in the name of Rav. Other statements he said, because the first one was, Mishinachnas Adar Rabbi Bis, uh, and opposite of that is Adal. But maybe there's some deeper meaning here, I'm not really sure. Shabbat Shachal Tisha B'Av Liopetocha Asurin L'Saperu L'Chabes. Now we're moving on. The week of Tisha B'Av, it's forbidden to cut your hair and to laundry, do laundry. This is what we call in Halacha Shavua Shachalbo. It's the week that Tishba falls out in. And if you think about this, the week Tishba falls out in, you would th- we always think, because we know this is the Halacha, it means the days up until Tishba, but not beyond that. But really the simple understanding might be the entire week, even if Tisha B'Av is on Tuesday, it might include up until Shabbat. We'll talk about this soon because we'll see there is an opinion that says that, even though it's not the way we generally understand it. I'm a Rav Nachman. So now we're going to talk about what kind of laundry is the problem. It's only if you're laundering your clothes to wear them. There's no problem with doing laundry itself, the action. It's just that you have clean clothes and we don't want you to have clean clothes. So if you're wearing, you're washing them to wear clean clothes, but don't you wearing clean clothes? It's not like where we don't want you doing the work, the action of laundry. This is lechabes v'lobosh. But lechabes v'laniach mutar, if you want to leave it for later, no problem. But Rav Sheshet Amal, he totally disagrees. This is really generally what we hold. Afilu lechabes v'laniach asul. Even if you're laundering it for after Tisha B'av, it's still forbidden. Amar Rav Sheshet. Now he's going to prove it. Teda, tebat lekatsre, tebe Rav. In the house of Rav, all his launderers go on vacation that week and they don't work. So, Based on that, it must be you can't do it and leave it because if they could do it and leave, to leave clothes for later, they'd be still doing laundry. Mativ Rav Hamnuna. Rav Hamnuna now brings a question against Rav Nachman that you actually can leave them according to Rav Nachman, right? You can wash them in order to leave them. This is a quote from our Mishnah. If Tisha B'av falls on Friday, then on Thursday you can launder your clothes for Shabbat. So now, Limai, what's what was the purpose of washing them on Thursday? Obviously, it must be to leave them for Shabbat. If it's that you wanted to launder them to wear on Thursday, my kvod Shabbatika. There's no kvod Shabbat involved. I'm wearing nice clothes on Thursday because Shabbat is coming in two days. It must be to leave it. And then what do you see from here? We allow it specifically on Thursday when Tisha is on Friday so that you have clean clothes for Shabbat. Avala Shabbat kula. Asul, but any other day it would be a problem. So that sounds like against Rav Nachman, who said you can actually wash them to leave. Here it sounds like you can't, only Thursday to Shabbos. So how does he answer this question? It really means to launder and to wear. But it means in a case where you have only one cloak to wear. If you have only one item of clothing to wear, then you can wash it on Thursday so that it's to wear on Thursday. But in order to make sure that it's clean on Shabbos, the reason you're doing it is for Shabbos, but you're actually going to wear it today, and that's why we allow it. And that's how Rav Nachman could read that, and it won't contradict what he said. And now we're going to compare it. I mentioned this comparison to Chol Moed. If you only have one item to wear, you can wash it on Chol Moed. And this is why many people do do laundry, because they don't always have enough clothes to last them for seven, for the whole holiday, or for the nine days, and therefore... You can wash what you what you need. I mean, that's kind of extending chaluk echad to more than that. But if you don't have enough clothes to go around, we could change our clothes every day, especially when it's hot, right? So therefore, you know, there are ways to permit laundry in both of these scenarios. It was also said, like Rav Nachman said, Okay, again, you can't 
launder in order to wear it, but you can launder it in order to leave it. But another question against Rav Nachman, Metive, says in the Bright, You can't wash before Tisha B'Av, even to leave it for after Tisha B'Av. That seems very clear cut against Rav Nachman. We're going to get into some other things in this Braita. Our gihuts are what we call ironing, or maybe some people think gihuts is some other type of cleaning, is like their laundering. Okay, This is the Babylonian saying that we do things a little bit differently than they do there. Our water is more dirty. When we wash our clothes, it's not really washing. Therefore, we can actually wash our clothes, but it's the gihuts that gets the clothes actually really clean, and that's a problem. And clay pishtan and behemishum gihuts. There's no problem of, of doing gihuts to clay, to flax, to linen clothing, because it doesn't, they're, they don't, right, there's a bit of a question why this is, but it seems because they don't, it doesn't really affect them so much, okay? It doesn't really clean them. So in any case, the main part is, it says the sur lechabes lefnei tisha ba'av, even to leave them for after tishbab, that seems clearly against Rav Nachman, and in fact, the Gemara says to Yufta. That really is a knockout for Rav Nachman's approach. Shalach Rav Yitzchak Bar Giyore Mishmei de Rabbi Yochanan. Now we're going to go into this clay pishtan. Afa pishamru clay pishtan em behem mishum gihuts. Even though it says that there's no issue of doing gihuts to them on the nine days, on linen clothing. Aval asur le lavsham b'shabbat shachal tishabav liyopa tochabi. You can't wear these clothes at all on the night in the week that tishbav falls out on because they're, not, they're considered nice clothing even without the gihuts. Amarav. Now we're getting back to this Shavuot Shachalbo, where I mentioned before. Rav says we only mean the days before, which is what we call Shavuot Shachalbo, the week of Tisha B'av. But once Tisha B'av passes, Mutal. Shmuel says even after Tisha B'av, it's still forbidden. So, we're now going to bring a question against Shmuel, who said the whole week includes the days after Tisha B'av. We're going to have a question from a Brayta. So the week of Tisha B'av, you can't launder your clothes, you can't take a haircut. You could do it when Thursday, when it comes out on Erev Tisha B'av, for Shabbat. Ketzad. How does this work out? So you're going to see a bunch of options. If Tisha B'av falls on Sunday, there is no Shavu Shachalbo. You can do wash the whole week. Right? This is people who hold by just Shavu Shachalbo, often Sfaradim hold this way. No problem. You know, you can end up without even Shavuot Shachalbo, right? The Ashkenazim are stringent and have three weeks before it. Notice that doesn't appear anywhere here. We'll get soon to where we have the, the custom of the nine days that start from Rosh Chodesh. So if it's on Sunday, you can basically do laundry all week because all the days of the week are after Sunday. If it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, before it's a problem, after you can do it. If it's Friday, that's what we already saw before. When Tishba falls on Friday, you're allowed to do your laundry on Thursday. What if you didn't, and now you're stuck and you don't clean clothes for Shabbat? On Friday, toward late afternoon, you're allowed to do laundry, even though it's Tisha B'av. That's radical. But, Abaye, or maybe Rabbi Ahab Yaakov curses anyone who gets themselves into that situation. You don't want to be there. You don't want to be doing that. Washing your clothes on Tisha B'Av. Now, the Bright is continuing into other things. We already have our contradiction because it's clear from here that the week of Tisha B'Av is only the days before and not the days after. We already had all these examples. But in the meantime, we're going to keep going on in this Bright about some other topics. If Tisha B'Av falls out on Sunday or Thursday. Now we're going to talk about Torah reading. Normally, Mondays and Thursdays, you read from the Torah, three aliyot. Korin shlosha maftir echad. So now on Tisha B'Av, there's maftir and there's haftorah. You, you say, so now they say, so three people read, then you have maftir and haftorah. So now, bishlishi ubirivi'i, but if it comes out on Tuesday or Wednesday, where normally you don't have three aliyot, because you don't have any aliyot, there's no Kriyat Torah, but it's Tisha B'av. When we read from the Torah on Tisha B'av, we read it in a bit of a different way than normal. Kore echad umaftir echad. We only have one normal person who lanes, one aliyah, and one maftir. So you don't end up with three aliyot. We don't hold this way, but this is an opinion. Rabbi Yossi Omer, and this is what we hold by, lo'olam kolin shlosha umaftir echad. No, you have three aliyot, and then you have maftir, and of Torah. So that's our, that's our case. 
So now going back to the beginning of the source to to Shmuel, the so friendly knockout for Shmuel, because it says it's not the days after. So what could Shmuel answer? Amal Shmuel Tinaihi. Ah, this is a Tanaitic debate, and I hold by a different opinion. Titania, as it says in the following bright, and now we're going to see there's actually three opinions. We'll get now to Rosh Chodesh. Titania, Tishabav Shachali Opa Shabbat, if Tishabav falls on Shabbat, Vachain Erev Tishabav Shachali Opa Shabbat, or if Erev Tishabav is on Shabbat, and then you push off Tishabav to Sunday. You can eat all day Shabbat. This, by the way, isn't why we brought this source yet. But you can eat all day Shabbat. You can even eat a, a meal of kings, no problem, even though it's really Tisha B'Av or it's Erev Tisha B'Av, because it's Shabbos. Here comes our important line. Rabbi Meir says, from Rosh Chodesh until the fast, that's the nine days as we call them, you cannot uh, wash your hair or do laundry. I'm uh, sorry, cannot cut your hair or do laundry, wash your clothes. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, kol chodesh kulo asu. This is an opinion that we don't see practice nowadays, which is all of the month of Av is a problem. Rashbag Omer, eno asu, ela ota Shabbat bilvad. Rashbag says it's just that week. Now that week, Rashbag seems to be saying like Shmuel says, which is you have the entire week. Okay, the entire week, including the days after. Vitanya Idach, there's another bright tip that says, which is very similar, Vinoheg Evel Me Rosh Chodesh Vadatanit, you have Avelut, okay, morning practices from Rosh Chodesh until the fast, Divre Rabbi Meir. Again, the, the dates are going to line up with the previous. Rabbi Meir says from Rosh Chodesh, Rabbi Yehuda Omer Kola Chodesh Kula Asur, the whole month is forbidden. And Rashbag Omer Ino Asur Elo Tashabab Bilvad, and Rashbag again says just that week. What's the debate between them? They all learn from the same verse. That is a pasuk from Hosea. I'm going to put an end to all their happiness on the holidays, uh, or the Chaga, we'll see what that means. Chodsha, the months, and the Shabbata, it's Shabbatot, or weeks, or we don't know exactly, so let's read. Mandamar me Rosh Chodesh Aratanid. If you say Rosh Chodesh, they learn it from Michaga, because Chag, Rosh Chodesh is called Chag. So that's from Rosh Chodesh. Mandamar Kol Chodesh Kol Asur Michodsha, because there were three things mentioned there. It's Chag, it's, it's month, and Mandamar Kol Shabbat Kula Mishabta. They understand Shabbat as week, and it's the entire week. Okay, so I will stop your happiness either Chaga from the Chag until the day of the burning, or Chodsha the whole month, or Shabta, the week where Tisha B'av falls out. With that, we'll finish for today. Have a Shabbat Shalom or Shavuot Tov, everybody.